The following program was made possible thanks to the generous support of our Kickstarter backers. Sup, Holmes? Beware! Your host, Jonathan Holmes! Oh my god, this is real! Ron Gilbert is on the show! The Ron... Ron Gilbert is on the show? He's really on the show, guys. Ron Gilbert, is that really you? Yeah, this is me. As far as I know, I mean... You're so unimpressed! Yeah, I guess you're you every day. It's, it's nothing yeah, special yeah. to you. Yeah, you've been you for as long as you probably remember, I assume. Many um, years. Thank you so much for being on the show. For people who don't know, Ron Gilbert been in the industry uh, for, for many years, made many games, has never quit. Most recent game he's uh, made that I've played is uh, The Cave. That You can get that on consoles and computers. Is it on every console, Ron? It's, yeah, it's on uh, the, you know, the PlayStation and Xbox and PC and Android and iOS and... Yeah, I've reviewed oh, yeah. the Wii U version for a magazine called Nintendo Force. Uh, I was very excited to get to review it. Uh, what an awesome game. What was your first game, Ron? Do you remember? The first game I worked on was uh, Cronus Rift, and that's kind of why I was hired at Lucasfilm to begin with, was to port that game from the Atari 800 to the Commodore 64. So that was the first game I actually worked on. The first game that I designed was Maniac Mansion. Ha! Huh. Chronos Rift. Uh, I'm trying to... Huh. Man, so many different places I could go. But Maniac Mansion, of course, life-changing. I don't have the box for that with me, but I do have this newspaper that I've read for the past 20 years. Or <laughs> four. It's uh, nice. the National Inquisitor, Holy Men Seek God. And this is from Zach McCracken, which is a game, if I remember correctly, you also made art by Steve Purcell. If I'm... Did you write this newspaper? Did you write it, Ron? Oh, what? Internet down? You gotta be kidding me. Am yeah, you're uh, really breaking up. I can barely hear you. That is atrocious. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. It was fine before the the test. The test before, huh? Maybe I'm gonna shut off everything. Uh, did you write the Zach McCracken newspaper, Ron? No, I didn't. I, I didn't really have anything to do with Zach McCracken other than, you know, working on some of the technology stuff for it. That was they, that was all David Fox. Ah, oh, okay. Very good. Uh, Maniac Mansion, though, was uh, more or less all you? Who, who was the yeah, team was, on that? Maniac Mansion was Gary Winnick and I, uh, you know, designed that. Uh, David Fox did uh, programming on it, but uh, it was Gary Winnick and I that did the design for it. And when you were working on it, did you have any idea that it would go on to be so popular, be so influential, have the impact that it had on the industry? Uh, none at all. You know, it's like Gary and I were just kind of making the game, trying not to get fired. You know, I, I don't think we had any any idea, you know, of, of even the whole point and click, you know, thing, which, you know, it kind of almost set the standard for that stuff. We, 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 we had no idea. We, we were just having fun. Huh. My, my understanding is the term cutscene, which uh, many game developers basically live by. I don't know if you've heard of David Cage or Hideo Kojima. Um, cutscene, the game, is what they often work on. And cutscene comes from Maniac Mansion and how it would cut to a different scene uh, in the mansion, in the room, uh, various characters. It was one of the, definitely the first multi character that you control simultaneously game I had played and being able to cut between those different characters is where cutscene came from. <laughs> yeah, made... yeah, the terminology was it was a part of a command in the scum language, you know, which was the language that we had created to build the adventure games. There was actually a command called cutscene because it just it cut away from the action. So we just called the command cutscene. And for some reason, and I don't really know why, that that eventually I think made it onto the back of the box. And that's kind of where it where it came from. It's my understanding, anyway. Huh. So you kind of invented cutscenes by accident. Well, I think I think it was coining the phrase. Certainly, yeah. games before Maniac Mansion, you know, had done you know interstitial interstitial scenes, but but I think it was the coining of the word that came from that game. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
pretty awesome. Uh, how has it been to remain in the industry? Because so many people who were in the industry uh, when you got started have since left, but you've stayed and gone on to meet so many people, I presume, who are influenced by your work growing up. What has that experience been like? Well, yeah, I've been in the industry a long time, and it's, you know, in some ways it's changed a lot, and in other ways it hasn't changed at all. But mm -hmm. I I love making games. I I can't imagine doing anything else. So I I don't know what I would go do if I didn't make games. I'm I'm probably fairly unemployable actually, if not for games. <laughs> so uh, to, to be clear, I want to make sure that because you never know what you don't know. So I think I know what you actually do on games. But uh, and uh, now that I'm thinking about it, I, I'm trying to think of something you don't do on games. You don't do the music. What do you do? I don't do music and I don't do art. I am really, really crappy at art. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, there is no way. I mean, if you if you give me a beautiful picture and you ask me to like add two or three pixels to it, I will make it ugly. I will find the two or three pixels out of the millions on this art that just turns it into the ugliest thing you can imagine. That's how bad I am at art. So I do not do art and I do not do music, but I do I do design and I do programming. Uh, did you do the who made this face that I'm seeing today? Where did that come from? The the oh the face that was uh, that was actually Gary Winnick. You know, oh he really? Did all, he did all the art in Maniac Mansion. Yeah, he 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 built that. Yeah. Is he still working in the industry? Uh, he's not. Uh, in yeah, I, not directly. No. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He does art. I mean, he still does a lot of art. He does he does a lot of graphic novels and that kind of thing. Cool. Uh, but you've stayed in the industry. Have you ever been tempted to leave because you've got the kind of talent that you could end up, I don't know, writing screenplays, writing books? Maybe you've already done some of that stuff and I don't know about it, but have you ever been drawn out of the industry for any period of time? No, I haven't. And for the reason I said, I just I love making games. I mean, I I really love telling stories, but I like telling you know interactive stories. Mm -hmm. I don't you know I don't I don't want to write a screenplay. I want to tell stories through things like adventure games, where people can really get involved in the stories and you know manipulate them and experience them at a different level. That's just what interests me. So that's you know what I really want to continue doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is always surprising to me when people leave games for other mediums where you don't have the opportunity to just put the player in the character. Like, the, the, the goal of so many forms of art is to, like, try to involve the, the viewer and, and form a bond between them and the art so they empathize with the characters and whatnot. But a game, you can just put the controller in their hand, and there they are. It seems like just the best form of, of communication at least for me, or, or art, or anyway. Uh, yeah, when players, you know, when they when they start, you know, interacting with the game, you know, they are becoming that character. You know, and in you know first person games, you you really are supposed to be that character. And even like in the Infocom uh, text adventures, you were really supposed to be that character. Mm -hmm. In the graphic adventures, you know, like Maniac Mansion or Monkey Island. You know, in Monkey Island, you really, you know, you weren't Guybrush, but because you were really manipulating him, you became him in a in a certain way, which I, I think is a very unique thing in the interactive medium. And and I think that's something that you know in twenty thirty years from now it is going to be one of the most powerful mediums we have because it is interactive. Because you know people don't passively watch something, they really need to be in there experiencing it and manipulating it, and they have the ability to, to tailor the experience to themselves a little bit. Mm -hmm. We don't really have the technology or the bandwidth or even the creative language to do that right now, but that is going to be the future. You know, it's the, it's the holodeck on the enterprise. It's it's being able to be in something and have it have it tailored to what you want. That that, that is the power of what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, exciting to see where it's going. And you helping build video games uh, as what they are today. An entire well, the, you know more about it than me, so please correct me if I'm wrong. But the the kind of games you started with Maniac Mansion, the the point and click. Uh, uh, the interspersing between uh, B 
being the character and controlling them and then sitting back and watching the character and kind of going in and out of whether you're embodying the character at the time. Uh, collecting the inventory in the particular, I mean, just so many uh, aspects of the scum system you see in so many games today, uh, Telltale's games, um, variety of different point-and-click adventure games, you kind of made, made that up, did you? It seems like you did. It was the first one I ever played, certainly. Well, it was definitely the beginning of that stuff. You know, Sierra Online had done graphic adventures before LucasArts started getting into them and things like King's Quest. And, you know, and they were a real hybrid between the text adventures and graphic adventures because you still had a parser, you still typed in words, you know, you still did that. And, and that's really where the whole point and click interface in Maniac Mansion came from was, was really, you know, my, my and Gary's frustration with having to type on a keyboard, you know, we wanted to, we didn't want to have to type plant when we clearly see the plant on the screen, we just wanted to point at the plant. So, you know, that's where that whole point and click thing came from, which, you know, which is, you know, basically laziness, which, which I think is where a lot of innovation comes from, right? People are just lazy, so they innovate, and that's, I guess that's what we did. Sure, sure. So many of the developers we talked to on the show, they, they tell me, they were willing to take the risk and have the inspiration to do a new thing in their game design because they found other people's game design so frustrating. And it's not like a personal thing. They weren't mad at the developer, but they were like, ugh, I can do something that's not going to be this unpleasant, and therefore amazing games come out of that. Is there, there are any times today when you're playing a new video game and you're thinking, well, uh, I'd like to be able to change this so it's, it's less frustrating? I don't know specifically like that. I, 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 I am a type of person, I get very frustrated at UI. You know, whether it's a web page I'm doing or an app on my phone, I, I do get very frustrated with UI. So I am, I am always trying to figure out ways to, to you know, make the UI go away and, and, and have things kind of happen very naturally, you know, for the player. So I, I think, yeah, I think that's kind of something that I that I do focus on a little yeah. bit. It's something that often gets overlooked, I think, by designers who are so excited about their concept. The delivery of that concept might get overlooked or, or not prioritized. But if it weren't for the fact that you can point and click in Maniac Mansion, I don't know if I would have ever dug deep enough in it to, to find out how awesome it was when I was playing that on the Commodore 64 I bought with... Uh, babysitting money back when I was, jeez, how old was I? No, oh, don't don't say how old you are. It's just, it's just, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't like it when you know when I'm when I'm at some you know convention or show, and some person who's like a complete adult walks up to me and and talks about how much they loved you know playing Pajama Sam when they were a little kid, and that just that just makes me feel old, you know. It makes me feel good at some level, but oh man, am I really that old? In Pajama Sam, uh, Freddy Fish, the games you made with Humongous Entertainment a yeah. little bit later on, um, which have brought you a whole different audience before the show we were talking about how the author of Grand Theft Auto, I'm sorry, Grand Theft Childhood, great book, she pretty much brought up her kids on that and then has gone on to be influential in the world of video games because of how your games influenced her children that made her want to do PhD work on them. So uh, when did those games come out? Those games came out, I guess, probably 93 or maybe 94. Somewhere somewhere around then was the first uh, Putt-Putt game came out. And, you know, th th I mean, those games are really interesting to me as a designer because I had just come off of Monkey Island 2 and, you know, doing real true adventure games for kids. It was interesting because you really did have to simplify things in a way. You know, I didn't want to do kind of dumbed down adventure games. I wanted to do real adventure games, but they did have to be simplified. The interface had to be simplified. And kids are very, very raw in, in what, you know, they like it or they don't like it. And, you know, they're not impressed by technology. And it, it, was, it was really interesting as a designer to think about that in terms of games and kind of understanding, you know, what kids are really going to like. What is important about an adventure game? 
you know, characters are really important to kids in the game. Stories are really important to kids. You know, graphics, not, not so much. They, they don't really care about, you know, pixel resolution or polygons or anything like that. But you need, you need really good stories. And Humongous Entertainment, I thought, was a, was, it was kind of a period where I really got to focus on that. And, I, and it was, yeah, I mean, it was, it was great. Yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, over the course of your career, have you noticed things drawing you to different aspects of design, different things starting to interest you or things starting to bore you, certain audiences starting to interest you more and starting to, to bore you maybe? Is, have you seen a progression or an evolution there? And if so, what do you think has drawn you to where you're at now? Well, when I was back at Lucasfilm, I mean, one of the things that you know we talked about as a group a lot was, you know, we can't we can't wait for the day when everybody plays video games because the video game you know market was a very very niche market back then, and you know a lot of people hadn't even heard of real of video games before, and we really longed for that world where everybody played video games, and and in some way we have that right now. You know, we we. we you know, you have parents who grew up on video games that it's just natural for them to pass on that, you know, that love to their kids. And you have this whole generation that, you know, I take the bus or I go anywhere and everybody's playing games on their phone. Everybody really does play games now. And, and I think that is a very interesting market. I mean, that is a market I'm interested in, not, not necessarily in like, you know, dumbed down free to play games, but the fact that they're, it is acceptable to play video games right now. It's not a stigma that, mm -hmm. that people have. And I find that market uh, interesting, that kind of player or audience, uh, you know, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, this new world of a lot of people, they don't think they are gamers, so to speak, because that term carries with it a whole uh, social connotation, a whole, you know, concept, a stereotype. But they're playing video games nonstop with their phone, but they call them apps. They're like, oh, I got this cool right. app. What are you doing it? Oh, I jump over things and I collect gold. I'm like, that's a video game. They're like, oh, I guess so. Uh, yeah. I, I think if you're, if you're playing Candy Crush four hours a day, you're a gamer, right? Yeah. There, there just is no way around that, right? <laughs> Absolutely. But it's uh, uh, finally this integration of video games uh, into mainstream culture as opposed to um, escapist culture or tech culture. Now it's it's everywhere, but it wasn't for you at the start. When you first started developing video games, did you think to yourself, well, I'm resigning myself to, to a medium that's not going to be uh, appreciated by, by the mainstream? When I go to parties and I say I design video games, people aren't going to look at me like they would a filmmaker or an author or something. Is that something you just knew was going to be part of it going into it? I don't think I consciously thought that. I did games because I enjoyed games. You know, when I was in junior high school and probably through my, you know, freshman year in high school, I wanted to be a movie director. That's kind of what I wanted to do because I enjoyed storytelling. I loved movies. And, you know, then computers showed up in my life and it, it, it kind of gave me this different medium to do what I liked, which was you know, telling stories. Mm -hmm. And that's just what I was enjoying. And I and I and I don't I don't know that I, I necessarily thought that, you know, darn it, I wish this would go somewhere. I was just enjoying what I was doing. Huh. So the lack of concern you had, it sounds like, for how it was gonna look to other people and where it would go, just enjoying the moment. I don't know if Maniac Mansion would have happened if you were thinking, well what's gonna make us the most money and what's gonna make me most impressive at parties. Might, maybe not what you would design, or maybe it would have been. That came with like a, a newspaper. Yeah, you know, I've I've always felt that the most influential things always happen by accident. Mm. Like you can't you can't plan that kind of stuff. You know, Maniac Mansion, you know, was was probably influential because Gary Winnick and I just didn't have any idea what we were doing, right? We were just, we, we, we didn't know the rules. We were just making a game. We weren't afraid to make mistakes. There was no cost of failure in making that game. And it, it just kind of allowed us this weird freedom. And I think if you go in trying to engineer success, 
you're probably not going to have it at some level. You might because maybe you can throw a lot of marketing dollars behind something or you can, you know, buy players. I mean, there's this whole part of success you can certainly buy, but things that really are, you know, groundbreaking and change the direction of things, I think those things just happen by accident in a mm -hmm. way. But you, I, I think you would have to intentionally put yourself in a position where those accidents could happen. You, you maybe intentionally, maybe accidentally ended up at Lucasfilm with people who would let you experiment and take risks like that, and then you were willing to do it as opposed to being afraid of, of getting fired or making a failure, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm sure you were afraid of those things too, but you overcame that fear yeah, well, I mean, Lucasfilm was a great environment for that because we were a very small group of people. I think I was like the ninth person to be hired at Lucasfilm Games. And, you know, when Gary and I made Maniac Mansion, you know, it was probably 13 or 14 people, right? It was a very small group of people. Yet we were in this very large company, right? We were a part of Lucasfilm, right? They made Star Wars and Indiana Jones. And... You know, in some way, we we'd almost been forgotten, right? We were this, we were this little group in the company that just nobody even really knew that we existed, but we we kind of had this mandate from George that we should just go do really interesting things, and we always had kind of Star Wars out there to what we were shooting for. You know, it's like we all admired Star Wars or Indiana Jones, and I think it just kind of made us try a lot of stuff, but. But there wasn't there wasn't a, a risk of, of failure at that level. We were just trying new things, and we and we felt like we had you know George Lucas's blessing to go out and just try wacky stuff. And and it is this weird you know perfect storm of events in a way that yeah. that, that stuff happened. Huh. Well, it, it it sounds like a perfect storm that was in part by design. It sounds like George Lucas knew what combination of factors brought together Star Wars and he wanted to replicate that on on the game side as well. Wonderful thing. So you like know George Lucas and stuff kind of. Well, I mean we, we met we've we've met. I met him a few times in Arctic Lucasfilm, but I think that's that's my extent of, you know, quote unquote knowing George Lucas. Yeah. But I yeah, I think he was a real visionary in a lot of senses because he he knew this computer stuff was going to be going to be something in the future. He didn't know what, but he knew that it was, and he just kind of wanted to assemble people that could maybe explore that uh, mm -hmm. a little bit. Sure, sure, sure. And, and here you are. Huh. Well, before I forget, speaking of Maniac Mansion, we're giving out codes for a game by Jasper Byrne, who put Chuck the Plant in his game because Maniac Mansion, such a huge influence on him. He, I told him you were going to be on the show, and he sent me like three emails about it. Uh, this is for Australia. This is for <laughs> you. So only Australians enter this code. We've got one more Australia code, two Europe codes, and then three U.S. codes. We got an extra U.S. code, which was good. Uh, so hopefully that helps you Australians out there. Uh, Chuck the plant. What the heck? How did how did you? Because <laughs> you're making a video game. It's gonna be bought by people, and it's by Lucasfilm. So it's like wow. And you're like, we're gonna put a plant named Chuck in the game. Well, that happened because uh, our our boss, the guy who run, ran the games group, a guy named Steve Arnold. He, you know, we we would, uh, you know, when I say we, I mean all the people in the games group, right? You, we would be in and have meetings with him and be brainstorming with him. And any time we would ever, you know, talk about a character we wanted to create, Steve would always say, "Name him Chuck. Name him Chuck." Right? And it was just kind of this joke where you, you couldn't bring up a new character without Steve going, name him Chuck. And and so when Gary and I were making a game and you know, we just created that stupid little plant, it was just a joke, right? It was just it was we just called the plant Chuck the Plant. And that was you know, more to, you know, satisfy Steve, you know, in some weird way. And then I don't know why. I mean it was just a, a little touchable item called Chuck the Plant, but it it did seem to take off, right? I mean Chuck the Plants appeared in lots of video games games. He, uh, you know, at least used to have his own Wikipedia page. And I, you know, I don't know why. It was it was just a dumb throwaway joke. <laughs> well, I like you're saying why, I don't know why it caught on, but it did. Yeah, those those accidents uh, can kind of have a life of their own because they're like nothing you've seen before. To me, being the analytical person I am, and I'm probably failing at this analysis, but to me, Chuck the Plant represents 
this is a fake world that I'm treating like it's real. Like you're you're acting like Bernard and and Dave are real when you're playing uh, Maniac Mansion, and likewise the characters in the game are walking up to a plant and being like, "Hi, Chuck." Like, why are you talking to a plant? That's not real. Why am I talking to a video game and pretending that's real? But it, it's this boundary is getting broken for me in the game, and then the characters are, are unintentionally poking fun at it uh, in the game. That's my meta analysis of Chuck the Plant, which you're right has appeared so many games you've had such an influence on so many people in part because you're like one of the only people who's done comedy right in games like ever and maybe that's a mean thing to say to all the other comedy games out there but i can probably on tops two hands count people who have pulled off comedy properly in games and so many people who no matter how talented they are and how earnest they are just doesn't always work what what do you think's the trick to making comedy work in games I get asked that question a lot, and and I don't know the answer to that. I re I really don't. I I think there are some issues with comedy in games. One of them is that comedy is so much about timing, right? Mm -hmm. If there's comedy in movies or TV shows, it's it's all about hitting that joke, you know, at the right moment. And with games, we've given up timing to the player because it's the player that is now setting the pace of that narrative through the story and you know it's hard to pull off traditional uh, jokes because of, because of that so your jokes need to be more embedded in the world like Chuck the Plant right they just need to be things that you discover in the world that aren't complete non sequiturs they're things that all tie together that you know, maybe build this larger, more humorous picture that helps define the world with that stuff. You know, whether it's Chuck the Plant or, you know, in Monkey Island, it's the, you know, rubber chicken with a pulley in the middle. You know, we don't need to explain that stuff necessarily. It's just, it just, it's just a part of that humor that seeps through everything. Mm -hmm. I wonder, because it's all, to me, it comes across as very subversive. And again, over analytical, maybe I'm looking for subversion and it's not actually there. But even the cave, the cave I felt like uh, very effectively parodied game design and narration and the way games are trying to tell a story while you're trying to experience it at your own pace. The, the intersection between those two is where uh, so much of the, the comedy came from. It really worked for me. Um, somehow making the player part of the joke uh, feel like they are funny instead of the joke being on them seems to be the trick. Monkey Island uh, is the example I'm sure it gets brought up to you a lot too that I always think of. The the combat system in the first Monkey Island was like I never wanted it to end. I would just do those over and over and over again to see all the different combinations. For people who don't know who sadly haven't played Monkey Island, it's right here. You can look for it your local store. This is what the box looks like. Um, when you fight, you uh, not only have to uh, sword fight with your enemies, but you have to engage in banter with them, and the more effective banter will cause you to win, and ineffective banter will cause you to lose. And I would choose how appropriate you fight like a cow every time, just because it was hilarious to me. Yeah, the, the, the insult sword fighting, you know, that was, it was kind of a response to that you know, things like sword fighting, it's really a part of the whole, you know, pirate, you know, movie cliche, but I really didn't want to do action. I didn't want the player to to actually have to have reflexes and, you know, turn it into an action game. Uh, you know, adventure games to me are about solving the problems with, with your brain, you know, figuring the puzzles out. And so it was about, well, how do you turn something like sword fighting into a puzzle? And before uh, you know, Monkey Island really got going, it's like you know we watched a lot of those old pirate movies, and you know one thing that really occurred to me is they spent a lot of time talking to each other while they were sword fighting, or you know even in the Princess Bride, right? There's the whole scene where they're like they're just talking to each other, and and that's fun, and that's kind of where the idea of like you know maybe this is really about how well you insult the other person, not how well how well you actually fight with a sword and you know it's just it's another place to do fun stuff it's another place you know to do comedy I guess sure. yeah and, and make an observation that you're you know the player is aware of that you respect your players intelligence but whether they put it into a conscious thought or not or whether it was just kind of something they noticed while moving on 
that's where so much of the comedy in your work comes from for me is you know things I know, but I don't know that I know them. And then you point them out to me uh, in gameplay, in, in visuals, in writing, and then, then I'm laughing. It's pretty pretty awesome. Would you ever make a Princess Bride game? Well, I, yeah, I don't. I don't have a lot of interest in working on licenses because, to me, one of the fun parts about making games is creating the characters and creating the world. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you're working on licensed properties, you don't you don't have that ability. You can't just make the world the way you want, or you know, add characters on a whim just because the story needs them. So I tend not to like licensed properties. I think really. One of the old, only licensed properties I've ever really worked on was the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade adventure game, oh, right. uh, which I did, you know, right before uh, Monkey Island. And uh, other than that, I just I, I like to create worlds. I like to create characters. Yeah, have it, have people pitched uh, licensed games for you to work on that you had to turn down? Not really, because it's not something I I kind of go out and and look for or talk about. So I just I haven't been you know I haven't been pitched that kind of stuff really. Mm, I I would I would be pitching if I were the guy representing the Golden Girls or Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai or Twin Peaks or. I, mean, I think I think the world is probably ready for a Golden Girls point and click adventure game. <laughs> I think so. It's on logo all the time. The the channel that uh, I, I can't remember how it represents itself, but I watch it like every day. And, and Buckaroo Banzai, you would be so ugh. and it would be rife with potential because they only made one movie. I don't know if you've seen that movie or like it. Oh yeah, no, I, I love that movie. When I yeah, came. you would make an amazing Buckaroo Banzai, Buckaroo Banzai game. Is there are people are there people in the industry that you want to team up with that you haven't teamed up with? in a while or maybe have never teamed up with at all? Or are there things you want to be doing in the industry in that direction that you haven't gotten to explore yet? Yeah, that's, I mean, it's a good, it's a good question. I, I, you know, I think in some ways I'm a little bit of a, of a loner on mm. those things. I, you know, I enjoy very small teams of people. You know, Maniac Mansion was, was really three people, right? It was me and Gary Winnick and David Fox. And I, I really enjoy small teams of people working on stuff there's to me there's a much there's a much um you know that kind of cohesive of that team and everybody can really contribute and have ideas and 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 really share that kind of common vision for things is is i, I you know i think is very important to me so i do i do like small teams of people mm -hmm. uh I, I know there's so many people who would want to work with you and uh, for some reason, I'm suddenly having a flash of Tony Bennett. Not that you're Tony Bennett's age. You're, you're much younger than Tony Bennett. But Tony Bennett did all these duets albums mm -hmm. with people who, like, grew up with Tony Bennett and were influenced by him. And it brought Tony Bennett to a audi new audience and it brought the people he worked with, like Bono and such. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, I invoked Bono's name. Now, like, everybody... <laughs> depressing on the show. But anyway, yeah, I wonder, a small team, but let's say someone who had grown up with your work and had found their own success, like Edmund McMillan, he grew up on your stuff, his games are selling in the millions. Uh, Lone Survivor, which I mentioned earlier, that game sold very well. If they came to you and were like, I've got this idea and it's my dream to work with you, Ron Gilbert, uh, uh, what do you think? Is there any chance you would consider it? I, yeah, I mean, it would be, it would be fun. There, there's certainly you know kind of art styles and stuff that would be fun. You know, maybe to to work with you know people on that you know on that level. I mean, I don't you know I don't know that I don't know that I'm I I don't know that I'm I don't know that I work well with other people. I guess you know. <laughs> I do know. No, exactly. I don't. I don't know how else to say that except say that. You know, it's like. So I just, you know, I don't. I don't know that that would ultimately, um, you know, be successful. I guess. Sure, sure, sure. Just being honest. <laughs> That's nothing better than honesty. <laughs> and you have you have worked very well with very many people, but you've also done very well in a two man team or or a one man project. So yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, what I, I, would, I, I would, you know, I'd love to work with like, you know, Gary Winnick again. I mean, we had a great, you know, we had a great collaboration, you know, on Maniac Mansion. I mean, there's, there's stuff like that that would, that would really be, you know, really be fun to do. And, you know, I often, you know, I'll be looking around and I'll see, you know, art 
that I think is really neat. And it's like, wow, it would be neat to, you know, do a game or an adventure game kind of in that art style, and it would be fun to, you know, maybe work with that artist to do to do stuff. So, yeah, I think I think those kinds of things would be fun. And, I mean, I do enjoy working with people a lot. You know, Clayton Kozlerik, you know, he and I made Scurvy Scallywags, which was the iOS Android game that, you know, came out about a year ago. It's like, you know, we... You know, he did all the art and I did the programming and stuff. So, you know, there are people that I do enjoy working with. Sure. I'd imagine having those roles defined and having a relationship that you don't have to worry about what they're thinking. Like the, 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 the I don't, we've only been talking for a few minutes, so I wouldn't claim to know you, but I would get the sense that if there was someone who was just like worshiping you the whole time working on a project and you came up with an idea and you bounce it off them, they're like, sure, whatever you want, Ron. Ron, can you do that line for Maniac Mansion again? Just like well, loving it. That would be you know, awesome. when, you're, when you're doing any kind of a creative endeavor with somebody, you, you have to be able to be able to tell them their idea sucks. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you're doing something, 90% of your ideas that you come up with are going to be stupid, right? That's, that's a part of brainstorming. It's, it's a part of sitting down and just and throwing out ideas and, you know, having people go, oh, that's horrible, that's horrible, that's horrible, that's horrible, ooh, that's neat, right? Mm -hmm. And so there is an honesty and a trust that does, you know, need to happen in any kind of a, you know, creative environment. And, you know, and part of that is just being able to say, hey, that idea stinks. Right. And, you know, a lot of times when I throw out ideas, I know they stink, but I'm going to throw them out anyway because maybe there's one little piece of the idea that doesn't stink and somebody will latch on to that to go, yeah, yeah, that's a dumb idea, but this one little thing is actually kind of cool and then we'll build on that you know, in, into something that actually makes it into the game. So you just, you need to be able to, to, to not worry about what people think and people need to be able to kind of, you know, speak the truth to you about stuff. Right. You need to be comfortable uh, putting anything out there, but you also need to be ready for being shot down or at least have most of the idea rejected while a piece of it is extrapolated. I think creativity is about failure more than it is anything else. It's it's about being comfortable going out there and failing over and over and over and over again until something happens. You know, when people write a great novel, they don't just kind of sit down and pound out a great novel and they're done with it. You know, it's it's an agonizing, excruciating process. Well, and you and, have to be comfortable with failure, you know, or you're, or you're not going to succeed in a creative environment. Sure. Uh, and, but why do they, when it's agonizing, when your ideas are not good, you, you don't quit, though. You keep going, regardless. Why do you think that is? Uh, it's, you know, stubbornness or stupidity or, or something. But, I mean, I, I don't know a lot of people that, that exist in a creative environment, you know, whether it be writers or, or whatever, that, that aren't tormented by that stuff. You know, I mean, there are days where I will just sit there and I will stare at this, you know, blank, you know, screen, unable to write anything. And, and, and you really agonize over that and you internalize that and, and, you know, you end up at some level hating yourself over it and you just, you do, but you just, you just can't stop pounding your head against it. And then, then inspiration strikes, you know, and it's like, oh, and then stuff just flows out of you, you know, onto the page or onto the design document or whatever. And it's just a part of the process. You know, if, if, if you're someone that's kind of just getting into doing creative stuff, it's like don't be discouraged by the fact that you that you're frustrated and you're agonizing and you hate yourself at the end of the day. Don't don't be frustrated by that. That's kind of what what it is. Mm. You know you're doing it right if you feel terrible and everything went wrong that day. I I think I think if that happens, it, it means that you're pushing yourself. It mm. means that you're you know you're not willing to accept what's easy, but but you just you want you want this thing to be great and you want this thing to be good and you're not going to settle. And, you know, that's, that's not always easy to do. You know, sometimes stuff flows and just sometimes it just doesn't. And, and I think that's okay. I mean, it's that whole, that whole cliche of the tormented artist, right? There's a reason that artists are tormented. It's, you know, it's, it's because that creative process is so difficult at some level.
Sure. It, 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 the, the joy of embracing your work and connecting with it and connecting with your audience versus the fear of failure and the, the pain that, that comes with, with uh, not hitting your mark and feeling like, but then hopefully that fear and pain and anger will push you to do something even better, to say, well, I, I can't let that be the last thing I made. I need to make something else and, and keep going and going. Can you, can you think of a time when you made a game where you felt like, oh, no, I failed. That didn't work out. Well, there certainly are ideas that I feel like, you know, I failed at or, you know, I've made prototypes that I thought was were going to be very interesting and I, you know, spent a fair amount of time working on them and kind of realized, oh, this this is really horrible. I'm, I'm not finding what's interesting about this. And, you know, you abandon it and, and you know, you, you go on with stuff. Huh. But uh, actual finished products, you, you, you've been able to make sure that... Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly find a lot of flaws in everything. I don't think there's anything I've ever made that I go, wow, this is perfect. You know, it wouldn't, wouldn't change anything about this idea. It's like, there's just, there's always things, you know, especially when I, when I finish a game. Usually when I finish a game, I really can't play it for like a year afterwards. Wow. Because... If I do play it, I will just see all of the flaws in it. I will just see all of the things that I wished I could have done differently or the things that I would have changed. And so I, I tend to just kind of not play stuff that I've made for a while. And then, you know, as enough time goes by, you, you, can, you can play it again. And I think you can maybe experience it the way you intended your audience to experience it because you've divorced yourself from this emotional attachment to what it is whatever it is that you, that you've built and, and 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 it really is an emotional attachment and I, and I think that's why things like games really are art because you know as an artist you're just emotionally pouring yourself into this you're vulnerable and you know you're kind of creating something and you're you're telling the world a little bit about you know who you are and and that can be that can be very a very vulnerable position to be in and and you kind of have to, at least me, it's like I need to divorce myself from that before I can really go in and, and kind of go, yeah, this is actually a pretty good game. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was playing, you know, through uh, Monkey Island 2, you know, maybe not, not even a month ago. And, I mean, I still can't play that game without going, God, I wish I would have done that different, or I wish I would have done this different, or, you know, wow, this whole puzzle chain is really boring, or, you know, it, 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 I, I just see all those flaws in everything that, uh, that I do. The only complaint I have about Monkey Island 2, spoilers, Monkey Island 2 spoilers, it's right here, by the way, Monkey Island 2. When did that come out? Jeez, oh, did they put the dates on the box? You can it was 92, I believe. Yeah, I think you're right. You would, you would know. Um, I could not figure out the put the banana on the metronome puzzle. That, like, took me a day of just yes. going on everything. Yeah, I mean, that, that puzzle is one of those things... That I wish I could change. It's like I wish I could change the whole monkey wrench puzzle because I think that's one of the most hated puzzles in in Monkey Island Two. Huh. There's like, it. <laughs> you know, it's like like the whole like the whole ending of Monkey Island Two. You know, playing playing through it again. I mean, I love the ending. I love the way it all works, but the way the timing is set up and the way LeChuck just kind of basically randomly shows up and frustrates you. It's like I kind of wish I could do that a little bit more intelligently. Huh. And, I, and I think, you know, the ending might have a little better, you know, clip and pacing to it. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that I, I see when I, you know, when I play stuff that I've made. I see, I see all those things that I wished I could have done better. And, you know, hopefully, you know, in the next game you do do those things a little bit better. You know, even in, you know, in Maniac Mansion, you know, we had the cutscenes that you mentioned. But those cutscenes were were really just on timers. So, you know, 22 minutes into the game, the cutscene would trigger. And we, and we didn't really look at what the player was doing at the moment. We would just yank them away into the cutscene and it would go up to Nurse Edge's bedroom or, you know, down to Dr. Fred or whatever. And that that was one of the things that we, that we really learned from that is, no, you don't want to do that. If you're going to do cutscenes, they really should be triggered off events that are happening in the game, actions that the player are doing, just so the pacing doesn't feel so random. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But my counter, because every good thing has bad things to it and vice versa. 
the randomness of those events, the ending of Monkey Island 2, the cutscenes in Maniac Mansion, they truly made me feel like I was screwed. Like, <laughs> you're, you're in a world that is not your own. You've got to navigate through this, this uh, environment where anything could happen. And you're, you, you've got to, as, as a younger person at the time when that came out, that was, like, exciting to me because I'm looking out at this world and thinking, like, can I survive as an adult? I'm almost an adult now. And then playing a game that kind of simulated the random terrors that happen in an adult life was, was kind of awesome. It made me feel accomplished that I managed to get through it anyway, even though uh, LeChuck could just show up and scare the crap out of me. Oh, he's terrifying at the end. of it. It's like genuine horror for me, the end of Monkey Island 2. Um, it's so surreal. It leaves you so... Like, I felt so respected at the end of Monkey Island 2. Like, this is not someone who thought they needed to just give me a cliche storybook ending. They they thought I could handle something that was not what I expected and may not have a surface level meaning to it. I may have to dig into the ideas behind this. Uh, really, was really 100% happy with Monkey Island 2. It was my favorite game for a whole heck of a long time. And then I was, ah, I don't want to talk smack. Monkey Island 3, I could tell you weren't on that. Like, I, I wasn't as up on who was behind games then, but it just didn't feel like Monkey Island to me anymore. I'm still waiting for your next Monkey Island game. You think it'll ever happen? Well, I, I would love to make another Monkey Island. I absolutely would love to do that. That would be, that would be my absolute dream job to do. But... Uh, you know, Disney owns the IP. They own a Monkey Island. They're not interested in selling it. And it is something that I would want to own again before I made a new one. You know, not because I want to go make a bunch of money off it or anything, but I want complete control over it because I kind of have in my head that game I would want to make. And, I mean, I wrote a whole big thing on my blog about, you know, if I made another Monkey Island, and I, and I kind of talked about what I'd want to do. But I think I could only do that, you know, if I had complete control over it. I don't think I could do it if there was some larger, you know, corporate entity, you know, running everything by their marketing department and their branding department and, and all this other stuff. You know, we didn't have that at, at, at Lucasfilm. You know, we, we were given this this unprecedented, amazing freedom to just build whatever we wanted. There was there was no marketing department. There were no focus tests. You know, we did a lot of play testing, but we didn't do any focus testing, right? And and I think that's where a lot of that really neat stuff can kind of come from. And if I was going to make a Mukline three, I would just I I I want to make it the way I want to make it. Yeah, I, I, obviously. So many eyes would be on that, and your expectation of what you could do with it would be pretty high, and what everyone else's expectations would be really high, too. And if that were to be soured at all by a corporate umbrella hanging over your head, keeping you from being able to act as creatively as you wanted to, that would be that'd probably be better than not. That would probably be worse than... Uh, well, you know what I mean. That wouldn't be good. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think if I'm going to make... A Monkey Island 3, I, I want to be the person that fucks it up. Right? I want to be the person that is solely responsible for Monkey Island 3 stinking, right? Because I can take, I don't mind failing when I believe in what I was doing, right? If you, if you have conviction about what you're doing, you know, people can criticize your work and it doesn't matter because you're going, you know what, this is what I wanted to make. This was my vision. This is what I wanted to make. And if you don't like it, you don't like it. And I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the place you don't want to fail is when your vision has been compromised, when you've built something and external people are kind of making you do things. And maybe there, some of the things are good, but maybe some of the things aren't good. Then when you fail at it, you're like, oh, I wish, you know, I wish I could have done what I want. And that, that, that conviction is gone in some mm -hmm. way. Sure. So yeah. So if you know, if I'm gonna make a Monkey Island three, I want to be the one that fucks it up. Right. Right. The, the the regret you would have from making it with people you shouldn't have partnered with because they controlled it would be much worse than the regret of well, I tried my best and didn't turn out as good as I wanted it to be, but at least I tried uh, on my own terms. And leaving a mark of who you are with that game, that's gotta happen. That's just like there's things that have to happen. You making another Monkey Island is one of them. Gosh darn it. 
going to try to talk my way up to Disney. I know some Disney people. Here's another code. Australians, check it out. If you've got a Wii U, if you're like one of the million people uh, or so, that's kind of a lot, I guess. Have a Wii U. Hopefully you wrote that down quick. It's for Lone Survivor, a very fun game that I like. The guy who made that also made another game called Keith's Quest when he was 17 on the Amiga, which is just like one long Monkey Island tribute. I don't know how he made it either. I played that. I played. I played Lone Survivor. I did play that. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. I played that yesterday. Huh? How far did you get? Um, I got. Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how. I don't know how far the game is, but sure. um, I played for a while. Uh, you know, mainly because I needed. You know, I needed to see Chuck in the game. <laughs> Did you I, find I, Chuck? He's kind of early I, on in Hollywood. I did. Yeah. No. I did. I did find Chuck. I did find Chuck. Yeah. I mean, that that was a. It was a really neat game. I really did. I really did kind of like it. I was. I was a little confused right at the beginning. I think because of the UI was was almost too simple for me. It's like you know, you're pressing the X button. I, I kept expecting to have to press and click a lot more things than I did. But once I kind of got that, then then it was kind of nice to just kind of walk through the world and press the X key and you know explore things and and it was yeah I mean it was it was it was it had a really nice atmosphere it's like I was I felt like I was kind of slowly sucked into this I want to say nightmarish or weird but the, yeah I mean there was there was something kind of surreal about it that that I was that I was really starting to get into. He's going to freak the hell out when he hears all that. Jasper Byrne, he did the music for that game. He did the graphics. He did the coding. He wrote it. Um, it was his life's work for like five years. Um, Someone. Yeah, I, did, I, did, I, did, I did like the art. I like, I like the art quite a bit. He's going to be freaking touched hard by that. <laughs> and Chuck, uh, later on, Chuck is like a major part of the game. If you're good to Chuck, you'll get a good ending. And if you're bad to Chuck, you'll get a worse ending. Like, if you don't water Chuck, if you threaten Chuck with um, hedge clippers, <laughs> you threaten Chuck later, even though it's like a serious horror game, you threaten plants to, if you want. And if you do that, you'll get the worse ending. If you're a bad person, or if you do emotionally damaging things to others, it comes back and hurts you, and your ending isn't as good. Well, yeah, don't don't mess with Chuck, right? <laughs> That would be a T-shirt that would say <laughs> right there. So I want to we we've jumped around on it, but the 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 course of your career maybe people can get a a little bit more of a handle on that. We can just do the autobiographical stuff. How did you get the job at Lucasfilm to begin with? The the way that worked out, uh, I had when I was. Uh, I guess when I was in college, I must have been like a freshman or sophomore in college. I, I wrote this. Um, I wrote this program called Graphics Basic, and it was for the Commodore 64. And it was really born, you know, kind of out of my frustration that this Commodore 64 had these really, really cool graphics, you know, at the time. But the only way to really get at them, you know, if you were uh, programming in Basic, was you know, peaks and pokes and these weird like syscalls and all this other stuff. They really weren't exposed to the, you know, to the to the person programming it, and and so I decided I was going to write this a whole extension to the basic language that would, you know, give give the basic language sprite commands and music commands and sound commands and all these things, so you you could build a lot more interesting games uh, in it. So I did that. I wrote this thing, and I was, you know, really kind of proud of it. And so I sent it off to this company called Human Engineered Software that had done Commodore 64 games and I said, "Hey, this is a little basic extension I like, you know, would you would you be interested in publishing it?" And then you know, they got back to me and said, "Yeah, this is really neat. We'd like to publish it." And then maybe two or three months later, they said, "Would you like a job?" And you know, I was in college at the time and I'm like, "Yeah, screw this. I'm going to quit college. I want to go make games." So I quit and then I went and I, you know, moved to California because I was living in Oregon at the time, you know, with with my my folks, right, with with my mom and dad. And I, so I moved I moved to California, and I went to work for them. And you know, I guess like four months later, they went out of business. And so, you know, it's like my first job in the game business, and you know, I was laid off like four months later. You know, I guess that was you know shape of things to come, you know, for the game business. And so. I I basically said okay I'm kind of done with games and I 
literally moved back home with my parents and I re-enrolled in college and it's like okay I'm gonna go back to school and get my computer science degree and one day I'm sitting at home and the phone rings and it's somebody from Lucasfilm and they were looking for a Commodore 64 programmer and they knew somebody that worked at this you know other company and you know they knew I knew the Commodore 64 and they wanted you know somebody to port uh, Cronus Rift, the game that I mentioned at the beginning from the Atari 800 to the C64 and I'm like wow Lucasfilm, I, di I didn't even know Lucasfilm made games right, I mean to me that was just Star Wars mm. so I said yeah I, I guess that's how I got the job. <laughs> and you were with Lucasfilm for some time, you did. Like eight years, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How many games in those years? Uh, well, there was the ports I did you know, for Cronus Rift, and I also worked on the Ball Blazer port to the C64, and then Maniac Mansion, and you know, I did the Scum System and the Tech for Zack, and then Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and then uh, Monkey Island 1 and Monkey Island 2. Not I guess those are the games that I had direct, you know, direct involvement with. Sure, sure, sure. Not the uh, the Atlantis uh, Indiana Jones game, then. The Which one? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. The Atlantis one? Wasn't there an Atlantis? No, no, the Atlantis one, that was that was done, you know, Hal Barwood and uh, I think Noah Falstein did that, but I uh, didn't have any involvement in that. Gotcha. Yeah, so it was this, over this time, did you figure out how funny you were? Because it sounds like you thought, well, coding is what I do, and then in the process you noticed that you had, like, probably hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people quoting your jokes after that was that kind of an awakening there no it, it wasn't at all because you know a monkey island when those games came out they, they weren't highly successful what and no they weren't they, they really weren't Are you know you sure? i mean sierra online with king's quest and police quest and space quest they were just kicking our ass up and down the street their sales were so much better than our sales and it always drove us crazy you know at some oh. level so you know some people ask me it's like well how could you leave Lucasfilm at you know at, at, at Monkey Island 2 in this massive you know game and all this stuff and it, it really wasn't a massive game at the time you know it was getting good reviews but it, it really took kind of several years for that thing I think to, to kind of evolve to its current state. Same thing with, with Maniac Mansion. When that game came out we were almost disappointed in, in how well that it did. I think, I think this stuff just kind of takes time in a way. So huh. it's not like you know, we made this massively successful franchise. We, we kind of did something and it was a very slow burn in a lot of ways. Do you think piracy I know a lot of people pirated back on the Commodore 64 days. Like everyone I knew who had a Commodore 64 had played Maniac Mansion. It was like kind of the point of getting a Commodore 64 and then Zack McCracken to follow. I bought it, but I don't know if everybody did. Do you think that was part of it? I don't know if I don't know if it really is. You know, I mean, piracy is always a weird thing, right? I mean, you can you can quote piracy numbers and you can say that this many million copies of uh, you know something have been pirated, but you know how many of those people would have bought it? I mean, that's that's kind of the common defense is I wouldn't have bought it anyway, and you know that's a that's an okay defense. It's like I almost get that defense, but you know, yeah, but you did derive something from this game. So it's yeah. it's not like you can say, I just wouldn't have bought it because you did get something out of it in the end. But yeah, I you know, I don't know that piracy really was, was, was that much of an issue with the stuff. You know, I think Sierra just had, they had a lot better marketing. They had a much better following, you know, with the stuff. They, they, they were the leaders at the time and, mm -hmm. and people just, you know, tend to do that. So, you know, I, I think a lot like today, there is, a, there is a discoverability issue, you know. It's just uh -huh. it's getting people to discover, uh, you know, what it is. Sure. But, yeah, the, I mean, Maniac Mansion and Monkey Island, they were, they were not, you know, giant sellers when they came out. Uh-huh speaks to the world I live in, um, you know, in my day-to-day -day life. And I want to hear about your day-to-day -day life in a second. I don't want to forget about that. My day-to-day -day life, I interact with a lot of people who play apps on their phone. 
on the internet and then uh, here on the show, I interact with a lot of people who make video games, and the people who make video games were shaped by the games you made for certain. Like, it, it would be out of the question for anyone I talk to about making adventure games or making games about any sort of writing or humor to have not played your games. Uh, they, they went on to make things, the people who played their stuff in the first place. And I, I don't know if you get that a lot. Do you end up getting a lot of fan mail and a lot of, like, is that weird? I, yeah, I do, you know, I do get, you know, a fair amount of mail through my website from people. And I do, you know, run into, you know, a lot of game developers who, you know, say, hey, I'm in the industry, you know, because of you. Uh, you know, and I guess first thing I want to say is I'm sorry, you know, for that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there are. And it and it does make you feel really good. I mean, there's, there's no denying that, you know, that there is a certain amount of... Uh, you know, feeling, hey, you know, maybe maybe this was worth it in a way that you do, you know, when you build something creatively, you do touch people in, in a way. And, and that, I mean, that is a good feeling. It is a very good feeling. And the legacy just lasts. Like, you know, the, the Monkey Island re-releases came out not that long ago on consoles, and my understanding is they did pretty well. Uh, yeah, I think they did really well. I mean, I think a lot of people, their exposure to Monkey Island is actually through those remakes. You know, it's not necessarily, you know, through the original ones that that's, that may have been, they may have heard about Monkey Island or their friends talked about it, but, but this was, this was the moment that they got to experience the game was, was, was through those remakes. So, yeah, I mean, I think it was, it was really great that um, LucasArts decided to do those. Sure, absolutely. Last person, last new Monkey Island fan I met, uh, one of my friends, she is a uh, cultural anthropologist, uh, sort of like a modification of psychology. She fell in love with a Spaniard in an archaeological dig, and um, he found Monkey Island right after that, and they played it together, like the original one they found mm -hmm. on the computer. And he just says it's the best game. He doesn't know when it came out. He didn't pay attention. For all he knows, it just is a new game. It's not the remake, the original one. Totally. Uh -huh. it. Yeah. Still works today. Still, it wasn't yeah. like stuck in that time. No matter when you play it, if you have pirates, at least it's a little bit. And I've never been on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride myself. When I saw the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, I was like, why are they ripping off Monkey Island? So the like, yeah, there is there is something a little uncanny about that, but I mean I don't know that they ripped off Monkey Island. You know, people ask me that. It's like, did they rip off Monkey Island? It's like, well, I kind of ripped off the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, so I don't I don't really think that you can say that they necessarily ripped off uh, Monkey Island. And there, there certainly are some things in that movie that raise my eyebrow. You know, when when he's you know paddling the coffin through the swamp in the movie. Yeah. It's like, yeah, oh. that, that was kind of in Monkey Island, too. I mean, yeah, maybe they thought of that independently. All possible. But. <laughs> and there just happens to be ghost pirates in it. Yeah. 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 Huh. I mean, what, what, what do you do, right? I mean, it's... It would have been nice to get a thank you, I guess, at the very least. Yeah. Oh, well, now I'm going to get bitter. I'm going to give out another code for the North American audience, Lone Survivor. I'm going to leave this up for a few seconds. Hopefully that's visible. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And so from LucasArts, you quit after Monkey Island 2. And you went on to do what? I went on to found Humongous Entertainment. And what we did was adventure games uh, for kids. Like we did, uh, you know, Putt-Putt and Freddy Fish and Pajama Sam and Spy Fox. And, and they were... I mean, they, they were they were kind of real adventure games. That was that was the idea for the company is is that uh, we wanted to to make adventure games, but kind of scale them down, not dumb them down, but just scale them down a little bit so it could be something that kids would really enjoy hmm. enjoy playing. And a lot of that came from you know watching a, a watching a five year old play Monkey Island because. He was having a lot of fun playing the game. He couldn't read, so he had no idea what was going on in the story. He really didn't even know what any of the verbs were. But 
you know, you kind of discover that, you know, if I click on this verb and then I click on the door, it opens and, I, you know, and then I can walk through the door and I get a whole nother screen. And he was just having a lot of fun, even though he really didn't know anything about what was happening with the story or the characters or could, you know, read anything that was on the screen. There was something about an adventure game that was just enthralling. And I kind of said, you know, what if, what if, you know, we made games that were meant for that, for that person, meant for five and six year olds, and that's, you know, really where Humongous Entertainment was born. And you know, we did, we did full voice on everything, so they didn't have to read, and you know, the interface was simple. Uh, it, I mean, it still had real adventure game puzzles, but you know, they they were just a little bit simpler, uh, you know, for the kids to deal with, and. You know, I, I had this ulterior motive in my head that I, I wanted the humongous entertainment games to, like, train this whole generation of adventure gamers, right? They'd grow up playing these games, and then they just love adventure games when they got older, and, you know, everybody would love adventure games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did that come out of uh, any of that, the frustration that your games up to that point, like we were saying... They weren't uh, necessarily mainstream successes, maybe because people didn't have the frame of reference of, like, like to me, it, it's always been counterintuitive. I've never understood it. Like, anybody can play an adventure game, and yet it's the games that are, like, take a lot of technical skill that at the time were were, were blockbusters and, and this subgenre, which is totally open to anybody, was getting played less. Uh, was the motivation to, was your motivation to open up the, the genre to kids in part because it was frustrating that the your games had been sort of underappreciated up until then. No, I don't. I don't think that was a motivator at all. I, I don't think I'm a good enough, you know, kind of marketing person to really, you know, look at the market like that and go, oh, this is a niche that needs to be filled. It's like I tend to do things just because I find them interesting. Yeah. And you know, watching a five-year-old play Monkey Island was creatively interesting to me. You know, sure. it's like, wow, it would be neat to make a game that was an adventure game, because I love designing adventure games, make a game that five-year-olds and six-year-olds could actually play and enjoy. So I think it was it was much more of a, of a creative impetus than it was, you know, a market that I felt need to be, needed to be filled. Sure, sure, sure. But the idea of kids getting your game that must have been pretty, pretty exciting. And it carried you. You made, like you said, it sounds like you made just as many games with Humongous as you did with LucasArts. Yeah, I mean, probably more. I mean, I wasn't, you know, I didn't, you know, design most of them directly. But, you know, we made, we made a lot of games. We made a lot of adventure games. I was definitely involved in more adventure games through Humongous Entertainment than I was, uh, you know, with, with Lucasfilm and LucasArts. People should check them out, in my opinion. I, I, yeah, I just I just played again. I played um, you know Puppet Saves the Zoo just a couple of weeks ago, and yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a fun game, and I mean one of the things that we were trying to do with those games, you know, is is um, you know Disney movies, I think, and Pixar movies today, they do a really good job of of making a movie that kids really like, but you know, the parents that are going to the movie don't mind seeing it. They enjoy going to a Pixar movie with their kids because they're going to enjoy the movie just as much as their kids at a different level, but they're still going to enjoy it. And that was a little bit of the goal with the Humongous Entertainment stuff is, yeah, we're going to make this game for these kids, but we do want it to be interesting enough that maybe the parents can enjoy playing it. And, and at the time, you know, the parents weren't going to be gamers, right? Because the parents didn't really grow up on games. So this was all new to them. So playing Freddy Fish or Pajama Sam might have been their first exposure to an actual game. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we got a lot of letters from parents who, I remember this one specifically from this, uh, this mother who said, she couldn't wait to put her daughter to bed at night so she could go play putt putt, <laughs> and and I thought, okay, so you know, okay, maybe we were successful, maybe we were a little bit successful in that, right? And so you know, it's just it's it's just building it's building something that's actually really good entertainment and not dumbed down for kids was sure. was kind of what what we wanted to do. Ha! Huh, fantastic. It is. Something that pains me all the time, the, the, the way marketing is steered. 
and you, you mentioned before uh, not having a head for marketing, and I, I think that's a wonderful thing. I, I doubt that I would love your games as much as I do if you were thinking like a marketer. Uh, but they're so often marketed towards just a particular age, uh, gender, demographic. Uh, thinking outside of that, you made a game that somebody, several people, stumbled upon. They thought it was for their kids, and then it turned out to be for them too. Freaking fantastic. I'm so happy about that. We have questions come in. I'm going to do another code real quick. I think I left that one up for too short of a time. You might want to screen grab. I'm pretending I'm writing it down. Uh, it's a little small. Hopefully you guys can see that. All right. Questions. First one is from Kev. Jeez, this time went by. I can't believe how late it is already. Kev asks, some of your puzzles are brutally difficult. Do you ever worry that players wouldn't figure them out? Or would just decide the players of the game, or did you decide that the players of the game should just expect difficulties? I, you know, during during, you know, Maniac and you know Monkey Island and stuff. Yes, we just expected that they would be difficult puzzles, and that's that is what players expected. They they did expect to be stuck on stuff. They expected to really be challenged um, by that stuff. So. Yeah, we we were designing puzzles that you know if if you spent you know a day thinking about it that that was what we wanted to do. Yeah, and it, and it totally worked from day one with Maniac Mansion, which I loved as like I wasn't old enough to quite get Rocky Horror at that time, but I was interested in the fact that I knew it was um, tongue in cheek. I knew that it was uh, messing with convention. I kind of got that out of Maniac Mansion. And I knew I was scared of that world, but I was also fascinated with those characters. I knew that I had to uh, be able to survive something that wasn't necessarily fair. I felt like it was so freaking unfair when Edna just, <laughs> at any time, just forget it, you know? And, and that's life. Start over. Start over with new characters. Maybe you'll do better. Oh, But, and but isn't that, I mean, isn't that kind of what horror as a genre is about, right? It's It's about... You know, if, if it's a horror movie, it's about being able to experience that horror safely. Yeah. I don't actually have to worry, you know, about Jason coming around and stabbing me to death, but I can still experience the horror of Jason coming around and stabbing myself. But, but it's in it's in a safe environment. I think yeah. that's why that's why horror is appealing, you know, to to us as a as a genre. Sure, makes a lot of sense. Would you do you consider Maniac Mansion a horror game? No, I don't. I mean, I, I consider it like a parody of the horror genre. I don't necessarily think it think of it as a horror game. We, you know, the fact that people were startled and scared when you know when, when those cutscenes would happen or Edna came out. I think I think that was a little bit of a of a byproduct. It wasn't something that we were consciously trying to do with the game. We weren't trying to scare people. We were we were making fun of the genre. Sure. It's it's funny. Uh Toby Hooper, the creator of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, he didn't say that exact same thing, but he also said like, yeah, I thought it would be funny because he was so close to it. He didn't realize there was like this gritty, creepy un it felt unnatural just being there, and not that Maniac Mansion is as scary as Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but I felt genuine dread when I was in that basement. And I was like, I'm never getting this. They do this in video games now. You just get caught by the old woman, and mm -hmm. then you never get out. That's that, and, and that's my life now. Like I felt pretty awful in a great way. So well, I'm, I'm I'm glad I was able to make you feel awful. <laughs> A plus. Uh, Jesse Ball asks, seeing how you've been inspired by film, is there any filmmaker besides Lucas whose style you believe would lend itself well to game design and or lead to innovation? Um, yeah, any filmmakers that you feel like what they do would apply well to games? I don't know that there's filmmakers that I would I would think apply to games. There's certainly filmmakers I have a lot of respect for and that I, you know, I like I like their stuff. You know, I mean I love I love Josh Whedon just, you know, because of his writing. I think he's a great writer. It's like, you know, I love Quentin Tarantino. I love, you know, I, I there's certainly filmmakers that, that I really, you know, like because of their ability, you know, to do film craft. 
but I, I don't know that I necessarily think about them just in terms of would they make a good game or sure. you know would would that style from a you know from a comedy standpoint you know I love uh, Mel Brooks mm. you know and and the ending of of Monkey Island too is you know is 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 very influenced by the end of Blazing Saddles. Huh. I I just I love the way that the end of Blazing Saddles kind of just goes off the rails. It's like you you think you're watching one movie and then in the end you just it's like your mind just goes what the hell am i watching here you know as it just it just goes in this direction your brain did not expect and so you know the end of monkey island 2 is very much influenced you know by the end of of blazing saddles and i and i really do you know like mel brooks and you know uh you know respect him a lot for his comedy now I just want you to make the Blazing Saddles game. That's all I want right now. Uh, and it'll, it'll probably never happen. Actually, Joss Whedon, I'm, I'm pretty confident, has played your games before. I just get this sense. I wonder what would happen if he called you up and wanted to work on something. I, I, do, I don't know. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> I love the, uh, the possibilities and maybe yes and maybe no of life. It's fun. Uh, Powell DZ asks... What is the most cryptic or hardest game you ever played? Huh. Yeah, what an interesting question. I don't know if you would remember it. For me, when I play a game that's cryptic or I feel like is designed in a way that was completely inconsiderate and didn't understand the way human brains work and therefore was indecipherable, I usually forget that game ever happened. But I don't know if you remember a particular time you thought a game was too cryptic. Well, like cryptic like a, like a puzzle game. And there's certainly games that that are... You know, difficult from a, you know, a, a manual dexterity point. And I don't tend to play those games a lot. I don't, I don't like games. I don't like games where you know it's all about just timing that move, you know, exactly right. And there's, you know, that that kind of uh, that kind of frustration. Just in terms of you know, like puzzle solving games or adventure games. You know, my frustration level like really kind of goes through the roof very quickly with adventure games. It's like I'm either in there having a lot of fun, or I will get frustrated by the puzzles and I'll just quit. And so, and a lot of times the frustration isn't that the puzzles are too hard. It's more that it's like, yeah, that's kind of bad puzzle design. You know, so it's more of this. It's more. It's more of this like professional snobbery. That, that kind of goes along with it, and you know, I'll sometimes, I'll sometimes just get frustrated and stop playing the game. Well, I'd imagine you've been behind the curtain so many times, so you, when you're playing a game, I'd imagine it's hard to not think about how the game was made while you're making it, unless the game is really doing its job. Is that is that often a problem? Oh, that that's a huge problem for me because I do I do play things and I'm I'm thinking like a game designer the entire time that I'm playing it. You know, it's like you know, even you know I play something like you know Kentucky Route Zero, and I can't play that game without just thinking about the game design behind it. I can't you know think about well how did they structure this and how did they structure the puzzles and you know, is this is this piece of dialogue pushing me, you know, to something, or is it not? And and I think I think that that at some level almost keeps me from enjoying the games as as much as I should. I I wish I could divorce myself from that. I don't know if if movie people, you know, a, a movie director can't sit down and watch a movie without you know thinking about all that stuff, or whether they can just sit back and enjoy the movie, but. But I think it is a little bit of a problem, you know, for yeah. me. I've I also played. I mean, you talk about humor in games and humor mi in missing in games, and you know, I was playing like the Stanley Parables, and I and I think that's a game that's actually, you know, really funny at some level, and it it is one of those games that that does um, kind of poke fun at 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 adventure games and it pokes fun at the interactive storytelling. It's like, you know, the, the narrator who's, you know, doing a lot of fourth walling with this stuff. And, and you know, I think that was a brilliant game in a, in a lot of ways and just the way it was able to do that and, and its humor and all that stuff. So I think, I mean, that's a good example of a very modern game. I think, I think does humor brilliantly. Davey is going to, Davey Reedon made that game. He's been on the show. He's going to, oh, yeah? his heart's going to be, 
Ron Gilbert like my game? Well, Although, I mean, I, I guess the one thing about that game is it made me motion sick. <laughs> well, yeah, the first person. Yeah, and I, and I'm just not a first person player, right? I I cannot play first person games because they they make me motion sick. So I don't tend to play a lot of those. But yeah, so the Stanley Parables made me sick. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it, it's interesting that because you, you you were around the same age, you might be a, a little tight touch slightly older, but we're we're in the same you know. 35 to 50 bracket or whatever. Um, video games, you didn't get into them, I feel, like in the in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, unless you wanted to get high scores, unless you wanted to, to have twitch reflexes and blow stuff up. Uh, it would make sense that your head was tuned to uh, film, uh, but you brought a film's uh, sensibility and completely divorced. You've, like, made a career out of not making it about uh, technical dexterity and skill uh, in in games. It, 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 it's, it's pretty amazing that you decided to do that. Well, you know, I, di I did play a lot of the arcade games. You know, the things like Asteroids had kind of come out when I was a kid, and that was all new, and I was doing it. But the first game that really engrossed me was, uh, you know, a, an adventure game. You know, it was, you know, the the original. I I don't think it was Colossal Cave. I think it was. I think it was just called Adventure. But it was, you know, it was on the college mainframe computer, and it was just a text adventure. And and that was the game where I just I really got sucked into it. And I mean, there's really no story going on there, but it is an adventure game. I think it it's it it spawned that interest in me. And games that were kind of about that narrative puzzle solving, as opposed to games that were just you know kind of you know, twitch and twitch type stuff. Sure. Although I mean I do I do like I mean I love things like Diablo you know which, which oh. is a lot of action and and stuff and I mean I I played a ton of Diablo. I was you know a completely addicted World of Warcraft player. You know I was in a a hardcore raiding guild for what almost three years, you know, where we raided two or three nights a week, you know. So the, there certainly is that kind of stuff that I that I do enjoy at some level. But I I think in terms of designing games, it is that more kind of puzzle narrative stuff that I enjoy. Sure, sure. Did the people you played World of Warcraft with know that you were the creator of Monkey Island and Maniac Mansion? No, not at all. <laughs> Maybe I played with you. Probably. You you might have. <laughs> Freaking amazing! That's like Bill Murray. Just you've heard about Bill Murray walking up to people and going, "They'll never believe you." <laughs> it's pretty hilarious. Um, all right, gonna give up another Europe code because we were, we've only got eight minutes left to show. So I'm gonna try to remember to give these out. Ron, we haven't talked about what you've been working on lately. Uh, the last game of yours again that I, I mentioned that I played was The Cave, which also did narration extremely well. Uh, a little less on the nose comedy as um, Stanley Parable, much more of a, a character driven adventure, really getting to know the, the personalities through gameplay, just like Maniac Mansion again in the cave. I really recommend people uh, give that game a try. And the, the comedy, you, I'm, I'm impressed you have not lost your touch for comedy, at least in, in my opinion. Um, as people get older, sometimes they lose their edge, they lose their creative spark. It, it just doesn't feel like that's dwindled at all in, in your work, in my opinion. But is there stuff you're working on now? Or are you taking a break? Well, I got done with the Scurvy Scallywags, which was the you know Android and iOS game, which which was it's a match three game, right? So it's I mean it's, it's quite a departure from the adventure stuff. But you know match three games are it, it is kind of a genre game that I really like, right? I, I played a lot of Bejeweled. I I really like that and and um, you know Scurvy Skywags is kind of this pirate themed. It's got a story, and you know I had a lot of fun doing the writing and, and you know and, and all of that for it. So I mean that thing that you know came out for iOS I guess about a year and a half ago, and it came out for Android about six months ago. So that was kind of the last thing that I was you know kind of directly working on. And then you know I've just I've built a lot of prototypes. You know I'll, I'll spin you know, a couple of weeks programming something up and, you know, throw it out and start on, start on something new and, you know, work on something. So I just kind of been going through this phase of, of just, you know, seeing what I found kind of interesting. And, you know, I am, I am, I've kind of latched on to something. So it's like I'm starting to focus down on, okay, I think, I think this is what I want to build now. So 
I'm I'm just figuring out whether is this exactly what I want to build. Whoa, really? So you've been going through a prototyping process, and now you're getting the sense that, whew, I can't wait to see what it is. I don't know how much you want to tell us. Would it be phone, console, PC? It would be a, it would be a PC game. Oh, really? Yeah. Whoa. Or at least, you know, initially on the PC. Sure. Woof, that's really, really exciting. When you said before, it's Dave Winnick, right? Is that his Gary name? Gary Winnick. Gary Winnick. I'm thinking Gary of Winnick. another Winnick. I know, my mistake. Gary Winnick. Thinking about you teaming with Gary Winnick again, I mean, it probably goes without saying that now people of, of wide influence are going to talk about how important you are. And if you were to team up on the kind of project that shaped the careers of so many other people that we've, we've talked about on the show already. Davey Reedon would be talking about the new uh, Ron Gilbert game uh, nonstop. So would Jasper Burns. So would a lot of people. Um, if you were to go back to that sort of thing, what do you think would happen? I, I don't know what would happen. I mean, I've always, it's like I've, I've I, I mean, I really haven't made a, a real adventure game in a while. I mean, the cave was an adventure game, but it had a lot of other, you know, components to it in terms of a real point and click game. And it's, it's definitely something that really interests me, you know, going back and, and kind of re re looking at that. But it's, it's like in some weird way, it's like, I almost feel like I'd want to go all the way back. You know, it's like your games like, you know, the Stanley Parable and Kentucky Route Zero are like, you know, really kind of brilliant modern adventure games, right? It's, you can see, you can see how their legacy, you know, is, is in their evolution, you know, is in those old point and click adventure games. But there is part of me that goes, you know what, I just, I'd really like to make just a classic adventure game again and not, you know, not try to modernize and not try to, you know, bring it into the present day, but... But, you know, it's like I had so much fun making those games from mm. Mini Expansion to Monkey Island. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely something that rolls around in my head. Yeah, I think people would have a lot of fun playing it, regardless if it had the Monkey Island name on it. If it had the Monkey Island DNA, meaning you and, and the similar artists or the same artists coming back to that, it would... Um, I think it would be huge. We've seen Tim Schafer do do very well with with Kickstarter. Um, how did you feel about that, by the way, when you saw how, how well um, Double Fine did with that Kickstarter? Did that make you think I should probably jump to that too, or did that make you think, eh? Well, I mean, I was working at Double Fine, you know, on the cave, you know, yeah. where all that was going on, you know, so I was... You know, it was kind of, you know, it wasn't my Kickstarter, it wasn't my game, you know, but I was kind of there, you know, watching that whole process. And, and you know, Kickstarter, I mean, Kickstarter has changed a lot since then. You know, I think Kickstarter, um, you know, today, you know, people are you raising a lot less money. People are asking for a lot less money. It's, it's probably more to like what, what Kickstarter was before the Double Fine Adventure came mm -hmm. out, right? Mm -hmm. Because, sure. You know, people were asking for maybe just five or six thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, and then you know the the double fine adventure came out and raised all that money, and then a lot of people started asking for a lot more money, and it feels like it's kind of come down again to maybe the way it was, uh, you know, was before that um, sure. with Kickstarter. Well, depending stuff. on your pedigree uh, and depending on how cool your project is, I follow a lot of Kickstarters writing about them for Destructoids.com, and there are still some that suddenly just make a million bucks if they. See yeah, I mean, what was that like? That cooler, right? Thirteen million dollars for. I mean, this wasn't a game, but it was. It was ice. It was my ice cooler with like a what a built-in blender or something. Thirteen million dollars it raised. <laughs> Yeah, it's still... it, sh it shakes your faith in humanity at some level, I think. <laughs> yeah, it certainly. And then on the other end, sometimes, when you see a project that truly looks like it couldn't be made any other way because it's not marketable in any conventional terms, like no other game like this, one that immediately jumps to mind is called Hyper Light Drifter. Oh, yeah. A yeah. weird art style, really made by a guy who's putting a lot of personal stuff into it about suffering from, from medical illnesses. And it suddenly almost makes a million bucks, uh, and they didn't even ask for that much. And, uh, every once in a while, from the right people, the right tone, and with the right pedigree, such as yours, I don't know. Maybe I'm being overly excited. It wouldn't be the first time. I better give away this code before I forget, because we only have a minute left. All right, I'm going to just do real quick this one and then the next one, and then I think we're going to have to close up the show. Hopefully that's, that's an O, if you can't tell. It looks a little bit like a D. 
And I you should have put the little slash through it. I know, I should have, but uh, uh, they don't have the slash on the actual Wii U um, uh, keyboard, so I didn't want to confuse people who don't know about O's. Uh, they probably would have figured it out. All right, three, two, one. Do a screen cap if you want, and that's that. Ron, it was amazing talking to you. I feel like I could talk to you all day. You probably don't feel the same way. I wouldn't blame you because I'm just some random guy that you decided to talk to for an hour and a half, and I really appreciate it. I often do that. I I often just pick random people to talk to for an hour and a half. It's like, Ron, (laughs) please please leave my house. Please, go home. (laughs) We'd like to go to bed now. Uh, it's just like talking to one of your games. You really are in your games, and vice versa. I've learned that firsthand today. Uh, people can follow you on Twitter. What is your Twitter handle? Uh, it's uh, at Grumpy Gamer. Right, and you've got the very same icon uh, on there that you've had here. And your games, where they, where can they follow them at this point? Oh, I don't really have any idea. Where's that is that awesome? I actually wrote a news post about it when you did it because I freaked out. The uh, ideas you had for Monkey Island 3. Where can they find that? They can find that on my blog, which is grumpygamer.com. There's right. a little article about, you know, if I made another Monkey Island, right? I, I kind of list out what I would do uh, if I if I ever ever had the opportunity to, you know, make Monkey Island 3 or Monkey Island 3A as I kind of call it. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, there was a point I wanted I wanted to title the game Monkey Island 3A colon The Secret Revealed or Your Money Back. That was going to be the actual title of the game. <laughs> Cuz there is a secret of Monkey Island. There is a secret to Monkey Island. It isn't something that I just made up. There is actually a secret. Wow. You still know the secret? Yes, I still know the secret. Does anyone else know? I would say there are probably less than five people that probably know oh, it. Oh, freaking God. There's got to be somebody that works at Disney who actually likes video games and has like played your games and is going to make this happen. Just because this is what life is about, right? You can die with as much money as you want, but if you don't do something awesome to at least represent who you were... Although, you I mean, technically, I would like to die with as much money as I <laughs> want. I mean, let's be honest, all right? Sure, sure, sure. You can have both, and and uh, and I hope that you do. If anyone's going to do it, it's going to be you, I think. All right, I think that's the end of the show. Thank you so much, Ron. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, I forgot me. Uh, yeah, uh, me too. But I should tell people I'm at Tron Knots on Twitter. You can uh, watch the show later on YouTube slash Sub Home Show. I'm also uploading an album of Misfits covers for Halloween on Bandcamp. You can look for that. And, uh, yeah, Libsyn and iTunes. You can listen to the show later in podcast form. Okay, sorry for my flusteredness. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.